Well, uh, thank you to Paul and Tim and Jeff for being sponsors for Marketplace Connections in Bellevue and elsewhere for a number of years. Partially thanks to your financial investment that we're able to do the breakfast. So a big thank you to you guys. Thank you. <clears throat> and it is all about relationships. It is. It's not about events. It's about relationships, isn't it? Yeah, that's really what matters. And that's really what Marketplace Connections is about. So I'm going to go ahead and tell a story uh, to get going. It was a good cross-cultural learning experience with Chan uh, last week. We met on campus at Edmonds. <clears throat> so I thought I'd tell him a story that I'd tell you because it's a good example of learning how to communicate cross-culturally. We've got 12 grandkids. Uh, Judah is a year and a half, and Finney is about six. Uh, my kids in Monroe live on five acres. It was morning time. Judah got up, and he found a banana slug. And he was in the process of eating the banana slug. So he was stuffing the slug down his mouth and all the slime was going all over him, everywhere. <clears throat> so my daughter was trying to clean him up and then Finney has a low tolerance for that kind of thing. So Finney was watching all of this and Finney threw up all over the place. So now we got a slug and now we got throw up. <clears throat> so Judah's getting cleaned up and then Judah finds the Kindle, and he drops the Kindle in the throw-up. <laughs> so we've got this huge mess going on all over the place. So I thought Chan would really enjoy the story, but then I thought, there's a lot of cultural stuff in that, isn't there? So I shared this with him, and he said, why is that funny? <laughs> and I thought, I can't explain why it's funny. <laughs> so I went home and told Pat, my wife, I said, we had this great time together over on campus. Pat, can you explain why that's funny? She said, no, I don't know either. <laughs> so don't take time now. But uh, that's one of the things that I love about meeting people like John is being able to hang out and learn from his experience and background. So thank you for coming this morning. And it still isn't funny, right? Ask your daughter. Ask my daughter. Yeah, all right. I'll ask Carissa, my daughter. Yeah, yeah, see if she no can. Slug in my car. Yeah, <laughs> no slug. There you go. See, there's all that cultural stuff. Yeah, so true. Well, this is a big, important question, and it's one that I'm no expert on. And I'd really like to just have a conversation this morning. I've got a couple of videos to show, but I'd like to just kind of have a dialogue around this uh, discussion. And I think you have uh, answers to, uh, to this question. So I love to just create a learning environment where we learn from each other, where we ask questions. So please dive in as we go today. Uh, and this first video is by a guy named Hans Rosling, R-O-S-L-I-N-G. He was a Swedish medical doctor. He just passed away in 2017. Uh, he got fascinated with data. And how do you display data to people in a creative way so that they understand it? So he put together a four-minute video <clears throat> on all kinds of uh, economic data over the last 250 years and data in terms of health. So listen to what he has to share on wealth creation over the last 250 years, and then we'll have a discussion after the video. Okay, so a question based on 200 years, and this is about eight or nine years old too, so some of this has changed, but you know, not, not in a huge way. Uh, what did you get out of it in terms of answering the question, how is wealth created? And I'm going to write your answers down. You have to have personal freedom. Freedom? Okay. Uh, you know, they talk about not the economy. Uh-huh. And let me ask a follow-up question. Why is freedom so important in terms of wealth creation? Because you, um, you can do what you want to do. Like, like you can start the business. Like in on the communist country, for instance, owning your own business in, until 1985 was illegal. Uh -huh. You had a job where. Mm -hmm. So you always were kept at a certain level. Mm -hmm. Is this in your country, Amanda? Which is? Hungary. Hungary. Mm -hmm. Okay. So freedom has had a big impact in Hungary, economically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
I mean, it just allows for greater creativity, uh -huh. whether it's in wealth management or creation or you know anything that's, that's ancillary around that. Ah, uh, right? uh huh. Yeah. When you're, when you're free, you're you're a whole lot more creative. So there's a correlation between creativity and wealth creation. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Good. Jim. There's a relationship between wealth and age. I don't know whether you live longer, you can earn more or you uh, earn more you can live longer but that basically showed that uh, you know when they started average lifespan was 40 years yes when they finished it was up near 70 mm -hmm. 75 mm -hmm. so whether you just stick around longer and you can make more or whether you make more and you can stick around longer mm -hmm. there's there's a relationship interesting and I think it's probably a little bit of both mm -hmm. that's good very good Booty. Being in a country where you're born in or you live in, just like Warren Buffett said, so you get a jackpot being born in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the country of origin makes a difference on wealth creation? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like Luxembourg. Yes. It's what you want. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep, they are definitely up there. All right, what else? Well, John mentioned this, but just the connectivity uh, between whether it's cultures and countries or economies. Oh, did I just say that? Globalization? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that is creating wealth. Excellent. Good. What else? Wealth uh, creates wealth. Oh, interesting. Expand on that, Jim. How does that happen, or um, Ed? How does that happen? Uh, they have they have more to work with. Mm -hmm. Things to get uh, into the the projects that are going to make them more money. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. <coughs> you agree with that, Paul and Jim? Absolutely. Uh huh. Go ahead, Paul. I think it also goes along with that. There's a momentum. I think mm -hmm. you see the momentum going, and when the interruptions happen. Well, history, it, it was a slight pause, but it just seemed to pick right up again. So, mm -hmm. so those door fluctuations keep the, the momentum so it's going to drive it. Especially on the stock market? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Woody? I think also the spirit of entrepreneurship. Because hmm. I was looking at the bubble of China. Uh, when they change, they go free. Yeah. So there's more of a spirit of entrepreneurship in China than there right, used to be. When they up. Chong, do you agree with that? In China, there's more of a spirit of entrepreneurship in China now than there mm -hmm. used to be. It's better than it's better than the last twenty years. Uh huh. Yeah, it's getting better. Okay. Okay, Jeff. Uh, I think hope. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Uh, I think in, you, you know, kind of in creativity and, and freedom, you there's hope for the future of a better way, uh, better way of life, better uh -huh. outcomes. Mm -hmm. Hope, you know, you you start to at some point you have to say, I don't like where I'm at. Mm -hmm. How do I get out? Mm -hmm. And you hope that it. Mm -hmm. uh, That's good, especially if you get to keep more of your wealth, right? Yes. Okay. Rather than have it taken away from you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That creates hope, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. All right, let's watch a second video here. And the same basic question from this video. Uh, this is Vishal Manglawati. Uh, he is to India what Francis Schaeffer was to the U.S. and the rest of the world. He's written a lot of good books on wealth creation, transformation, uh, follower of Christ. And this is a great video from his standpoint of looking at how Martin Luther's wife, Katrina, helped create wealth for Martin Luther. Uh, so we're going back to 16th century uh, Germany, and it's just fascinating. So based on that video, what would you add to this list on how wealth is created? I think we're stewards of what God gives us, and we're supposed to... Uh do 
So use what we have, Jim, something like that? Use it well, yeah. Use. Like the guy that got the, the 10 bucks and when the master came back, he returned 20. Yeah, yes, excellent. What else? explain the freedom part of what you talked about, the uh, uh, socialism that they just come and take it uh -huh. because they had the power and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh -huh. That's on the, the personal freedom of you cannot come into my land, you cannot take it. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. You have no right. Good. That's, that's I guess, to the, the more protection of your, what's yours is yours. <coughs> so, so property so, rights, right, Amanda? Yeah, property rights. Um, Money rights and not just property, but like your money and your uh -huh. safety and everything. Yes, yeah, good. So maybe learn and practice what the Bible says. Mm hmm. I think also just the willingness to work hard and not to shy away from things that are difficult, right? I mean, that goes into the motivation and the freedom and things, but mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that it takes it takes time, takes you know effort to, to succeed. Yes. Yeah. Good. I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily a part of this, but um, as you said, the motivation uh, you have to be not overtaxed. Like like when Henry first started, um, they were anyone who, who had the, the business, they were ninety percent taxed, mm -hmm. but they could not check it so it created a tremendous amount of corruption because on the books they only reported like tenth of day what they earned mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of them you know if, if you're too greedy you're not gonna get enough taxes mm -hmm. that's basically mm -hmm. so that's kind of like you know you treat people fair then there's no corruption because uh -huh. it kind of like, as a byproduct came of it yes yeah yeah that's good <coughs> should probably put taxes like in there right faith in a higher power mm-hmm drive you through a lot of a lot of things, good and bad. Hmm. Good Jason. Leverage I think is a piece where we're we're doing something that becomes the more more than the sum of our time. And so what hmm. we have is, is that I'm raising animals, I'm growing fruit, I'm huh. I'm doing things that are producing beyond my own labors. Yep. Um, we all have we all have a a, a ceiling when our Wealth creation is limited by how many mm. hours we can put in. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the phrase leverage others' assets for mutual benefit? Mm -hmm. Agree with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. Very good point. Anything else? I think there's a uh, like problem solving oh, aspect. Really? Interesting. Of it. I mean, the, I'm just reminded the just that in that story where. Here comes, uh, here comes a problem. How are we going to take care of this building? Yeah. You know, what's around me that I can use, right? And then what? Now I got all these people. How am I going to feed these people? What's around for me that I can use? Mm -hmm. it's, it's constantly looking at uh, um, creativity mm -hmm. and and what can, how can I make it work for me, or solve the problem that I have yes. mm -hmm. and not uh, uh, limiting it to, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I guess it's, uh, I don't know. So it's, it's, it's kind of a mindset, isn't it? It's a bit of a mindset. Yeah. yeah. It goes along with spirit of entrepreneurship, but it's the, the mindset that goes with it. And <clears throat> maybe using failure and setbacks as an opportunity to pivot and reinvent because I've been successful at killing some things lately including all of the monthly meetings in three places but it's been interesting to pivot and reinvent and see new things get birthed out of things that some people would say would be failure but in my mind it isn't failure it's just taking a pivot and reinventing and saying well what's next what's God gonna do here do you agree mm -hmm. okay Right. That's, There's health, some, that's healthy too, right? That's that's healthy way to expand your expand out of areas. Yes. Uncomfortable. Yeah. It is uncomfortable. Yes. 
And sometimes your identity can get wrapped around that, right? So you can say, I am a failure, which is the wrong pathway to go down, right, Jason? Sometimes failure is the best teacher. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we just count that yep. uh, in our culture. But, uh, I mean, if everybody always succeeded, you wouldn't know what didn't work. Yes. Well, also, you don't know, like, it just served for a time. Like, I'm yeah. going to miss this breakfast, but I got connected with your wife and a yeah. group of ladies, and we created a little, you know, yeah. mastermind yeah. in there. We, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we create, we created a really good connection. Yes. And that lives on. Yeah. And I have to leave my house once a month because yes, all the ladies have showed up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to I be gone. The broken plates, if you will. Broken plates over at <laughs> Rosanna's. Yeah. Just go to the pub. I think. Just go to the pub. Yeah, right. Saturday morning, oh, God, right? Yeah. Grab their notes, um, and I'll just refer to a couple of things and wrap up here. Go to page two, and there's a very interesting statement here that I think I have here also. This statement actually doesn't come from David Aikman. Uh, John, you'll be interested in this. This comes from a Chinese scholar from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, there isn't a date, so I don't know exactly when this happened. We were asked to look into what accounted for the preeminence of the West all over the world. At first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. Next, we focused on your economic system. But in the last 20 years, we have realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. This is why the West has been so powerful the Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life that was made possible, what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. Isn't that an amazing statement from a Chinese scholar who probably wanted to remain nameless would be my guess. <laughs> but I found that fascinating. So Chong, you and I will talk about this sometime, okay? <laughs> All right, we'll have some good discussions. Okay, I'm going to fast forward through some of this. Uh, there's a diagram on page three. I didn't want to disappoint Jim Johnson. <laughs> and I call it a gospel-centered economic diagram. And by gospel, I mean the good news of Jesus in the Bible. John, is there a slide for that? Yes. <laughs> there it is. You feel better now, Jim? Really good. <laughs> Warm and fuzzy now. Yeah. And I came up with some of this, but I didn't come up with all of it. Down at the bottom, it says gospel centered economic uh, is development is a movement of ideas grounded in the Christian worldview found in the Bible. And then if you go in the middle, it talks about the environment that you usually need to have in a country or in a culture. And it's an environment of freedom, law, and ethics. I would probably put private property rights in there also. And then in the middle, there's a little formula that I got from somebody, but I haven't been able to track down where it came from. It begins on the left where it says man's material welfare equals human energy, which can be three different kinds, mental, spiritual, or physical, plus natural resources times tools. So as people have looked at economic history and the increase of material goods, they feel that some of these things are strategic. Uh, I think the formula works for the most part, but if you take a country like Japan, Japan doesn't have very many natural resources. But they've had multipliers with tools, and those tools have multiplied what they have had to create the wealth. Quick thoughts on this? Comments? Disagree? Kind of going to chew on it for a while. They don't have much oil. They've got to import all of their oil. Uh, minerals, they don't have the mineral base like Mongolia has. Mongolia has every mineral in the world except for diamonds. So it's natural resources. Some have a lot, some don't have very much. Africa, massive natural resources. African nations are the poorest countries in the world. Why is that? That's part of it, definitely. Okay, skip on page three. There's a slide for this also, and I will wrap up. 
Uh, Niall Ferguson is a British economist uh, historian. He's kind of studied economic history. He feels like the West really got wealthy because of six uh, apps. And those six acts, I won't read all of them, competition, science, property rights, medicine, consumer society, and then he cites the work ethic that you just heard from Vishal Manglawati, and he feels like that work ethic uh, is critical for the other five apps. So he's got a book called Civilization, is where that information comes from. Fascinating stuff. Okay, on page four, I'm out of time, but if you have time, read through Matthew 25, 14 through 30. This is what Jim Johnson was referring to when he talked about some having ten talents. Actually, it's five talents, two talents, and one talent. And if you read through the passage, the guys that had five and two got rewarded, and the guy with one, what did he do with it? He went and buried it. And was the uh, guy in the story happy with him burying it? Not so happy. Um, in this passage, I personally think this says that profit is good. And profit can be used for good purposes. And part of the way we create wealth is creating profit, right? If you don't have an increase in profits, do you have an increase in wealth? Uh-uh, you don't, do you? Okay, last question. Why does it matter? Why does it matter how wealth is created? Good to know for your own life, definitely. Well, there's, I mean, there's ways you can create wealth that destroy other things. True. And I don't, I don't believe that that's the way you should do it. Right, yes. Creating wealth is building and helping other people. Yeah, good. What you're doing. Good, good, Jason. Excellent. Yeah. You can teach it to your next generation. The next generation. Pass it on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me close with a story. It's at your table right there. And it's a true story about the very tiny part that Marketplace Connections and the entrepreneurship training is doing uh, in Africa, actually. If you look at the poorest countries in the world right now and look at U.S. Uh, annual dollars, annual income, Central African Republic, $656 a year. That's their annual income. Democratic Republic of the Congo, 784, Burundi, Liberia, Malawi, one, two, three, four. Malawi is fifth, and usually Haiti is in there fairly close also. That story tells a story about a young man that got training in something called business connections. Business connections is the Malawian version of entrepreneurial leadership training that we do in India. So we partnered with uh, Children of the Nations that's based in Silverdale over in the Kitsap Peninsula. And I hardly did anything. The only thing I did was train two people to teach the material to 25 students in Malawi about three years ago. So this story about this kid is somebody that went through the Business Connections program in Malawi through Children of the Nations. Now, uh, several years later, this is a list of 25 businesses that have gotten started in the last three years in Malawi and Uganda. So, I, and I'm serious, I hardly did anything, but I tried to multiply myself. So I trained Cheryl and I trained John, a business guy from Florida, uh, did a little bit of teaching, tried to model the teaching for them. They've taken it and I don't need to go back. And I'd love to go back, but I just don't need to go back because they're now training the trainer with Malawian business people, they're going to be doing the training in other countries in Africa. So more wealth has been created, more jobs have been created, and that's just a story of a tiny contribution that we made to Malawi. Isn't that cool? I just, it's so much fun. And that, in part, got birthed out of these monthly meetings and God is multiplying it. So, and I'm trying not to mess it up. <laughs> working hard not to mess it up so I'm gonna pray because we're out of time if you want to come to the monthly group at Paul and Tim's we meet after Labor Day in September, yep, September 745 Paul and Tim's office love to have you come and I would love to see another group maybe get started in Bellevue 
And so we can multiply some of these groups in Bellevue, maybe starting in September, to keep the momentum going. So my thanks to all of you for coming this morning. Uh, many of you have been regulars for a long time. You're my friends. We'll keep hanging out together, keep moving forward, and, and see what God does. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for friends. Um, I love it when Jesus said, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. So these are friends that are here this morning, and we pray those friendships uh, would continue, that you would multiply them. Uh, thank you for John being here this morning. Uh, thank you for uh, international connection with him back to China. Pray for your blessing on him. Uh, next steps to a four-year school somewhere in the U.S. Uh, thank you for him being here this morning. Thank you for this time. Thank you that wealth creation is something that's important. It's in the Bible. We don't worship wealth. We don't wrap our identity around it. But you use wealth to accomplish good purposes all around the world, even in places like Malawi. Thank you for this good time in your name. Amen.